Hi again and welcome back. Um, in this section, we will go further into what the Hydra editor is and how to use it and start writing code. Um, so again, in order to use Hydra, you should uh, use a browser. Chrome or Chromium tends to work the best, but it, it also works in other browsers. Um, and go to the Hydra website and uh, you will see um, a window with some text in it in front of some colorful uh, visuals behind it. And last time we looked a little bit about how, how the editor works and what, what things you can do in the editor. And now we'll be going further into writing code. So go ahead and close this window. Um, and again, there's this shuffle button to sort of shuffle through sketches and change numbers and, and see what happens. And I really emphasize this at the beginning because I think sometimes there's this idea with code that, oh, I have to understand every single thing before I can start coding or before I can be a programmer. And sort of one thing I, I like to emphasize with this is that really everyone who's already changed some numbers is, is already a programmer. There's no, there's no sort of extra mystery about it. Um, being a programmer is just, is just writing code. Um, and also I'm good to add my webcam now. Hi again. Um, so another button we have up here is sort of this trash icon and that lets us start with a completely blank slate. So if you click on that, it should uh, be, the screen should go blank. Um, I mentioned earlier that Hydra is inspired by analog video synthesis, but um, what, what does that mean? What, what, is, what is analog video synthesis? Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this machine called the Sandin image processor that was made in the seventies. Um, you can, this is a Wikipedia link, so you could also go to the Wikipedia link if you would like. Um, and we see this image here with all these sort of boxes, and then there's a screen with some colors on it. Um, and this is, you know, not using a computer. That's in this case, what analog means. We could go more specific into what analog means, but I think for now there's no computer involved in this. There's just these, these boxes and the boxes have a bunch of knobs and a bunch of wires um, and they're hooked up to this screen over here. Um, and I, I um, until recently, had never actually used one of these, but it was something that was interesting to me sort of as a way to be creative. Just this idea that, oh, I can just have a bunch of knobs and turn them and, and start playing around with something. Um, and so what happens here is that each of these, um, each of these sort of, boxes either generates a signal or changes an existing signal. Um, and when that signal gets to the screen, it's sort of a bunch of voltages in time. And depending on what the voltage is at a given time, it colors the screen a different pixel. Um, and I'm showing this because understanding this way of thinking about images and image processing will help understand how to create images in Hydra. And I think anytime we use a software, there's a sort of metaphor about the world that's packed into the software. So if you've used something like Microsoft Word, there's the idea that you have a page, you see a page on the screen. We all know that's not really paper, it's just something that you see on the screen. But whoever programmed Microsoft Word created this sort of um, 
this box and when you type things on the keyboard or press buttons the letters start going showing up on the screen in a certain order and so that's um try kind of evoking the idea of a typewriter and even though most people don't use typewriters anymore we still a lot of the ways that we type is sort of based on this idea of the typewriter um so Hydra is based a bit on this idea of um, analog video synthesizer, but it is is not at all in, um, trying to replicate this analog thing, but rather take sort of concepts from that. Um, so, um, and just just to uh, reiterate one more time, the idea here is that we have. Each of these boxes that's either generating a, a signal or um, changing a signal. And when that signal gets to the screen, we can see the output of whatever that signal is showing. This is very similar also to analog audio processing, where just instead of a screen, you have a speaker and vibrations in time that generate a sound. Um, so going back to, to Hydra Editor, we have our blank screen here. Um, and one of the most basic things we can create in Hydra is to make an oscillator. I'll explain a little bit more what an oscillator is in a second. I'm just going to make it really big. Um, so I just typed OSC. Um, and I clicked the triangle and nothing happens. Um, and so what, what I just did here is I just made an oscillator, which we could think of as one of these little boxes. I just made one of these little boxes, um, but I haven't connected it to any output. So right now it's, it's as if I don't have a TV screen or something to see what's happening. And so in order to see this oscillator, I'm going to press period and out. And um, then I can press this um, triangle to run the code. Um, I didn't mention before, but there's also some key commands that you can use to run code. Um, if you do control shift enter, it will run all of the code on the page. So right now I'm doing control shift enter. Um, and if you do control enter, and, and this is in, including on Mac, it's control enter. I know a lot of times uh, Mac uses command, but in Hydra right now it uses control. Um, it just runs a line of code. And I'll get into the differences between when you might want to use different key commands later. But for now, you can either press the triangle button or press control shift enter to run a line of code. Um, and so right now I've created an oscillator and connected it to the output. Um, inside these parentheses, I can add some numbers. So um, here I put a three. I could see what happens if I just change that number. Um, so it seems like the higher number that I put in this parentheses, then the more lines show up on the screen. Um, and, and you can think of this, um, th these numbers as similar to turning a knob. So you have a, a module that generates a signal. In this case, it's this repeating line pattern. And this um, number affects a parameter of that function. Um, and if I add a comma, I can have um, a few other parameters here. So um, there's one here that's how fast, how fast everything goes. It's kind of subtle, but I want to slow it down to not um, get a little dizzy. And there's a final parameter that corresponds to uh, color. Um, I'll be going more into in depth into color in a little bit. Um, okay, so here we have an oscillator. We can see it on the screen. What else? What else can we do here? So, 
Um, similar to this, this setup, we can start creating more of these sort of modules or boxes. And in coding, these are called functions. So a function is sort of something that generates or modifies a signal, and it can receive different inputs and outputs. So um, let's say I, ha I have my oscillator here, and what if I want to um, rotate it? And so again, I can uh, have different parameters in, in, inside of rotate. Let's see, here we go. Um, and I can change any of these. And here I'm using the key command, control, shift, enter to, to run it, everything. Um, and so now I've, I've created an oscillator. I've added a rotate afterwards. Um, and, and just go ahead and play around with these different numbers to kind of get an idea for what they mean. Um, in rotate, the first parameter is is sort of how much you've rotated something, and the second is is the speed of rotating it. Um, the I can let's see, I could add something else like repeat. So now I've repeated, taken this entire thing that I've created and repeated it a bunch of times. Um, could also add in a kaleidoscope. Let's see. And I already start to get some, some different patterns here. And we could still change different parameters. And notice that the order that I do things in matters. So what would happen if I just put rotate here with nothing else? Um, we get this red, this red thing down here. Um, and so what the, I'll go back to what we had before. Ooh. Okay. And again, if you're using the arrow to run your code, you can um, go back to previous sketches using, using the browser forward and back keys. Um, and so uh, what happens if I type something wrong here? So I get this um, this red text at the bottom. So here I typed Olivia instead of oscillator. And this red text is sort of the computer saying, I don't understand what you're trying to say. Um, you might be asking, for example, why why do some words work and not others? Um, and the answer is that just because, sort of. Um, any programming language has a set of words that work or don't work, and those words are determined by whoever made the, the program. And so um, because I made this program, these are the words that... Um, you can use in it. Um, but there's no, what I want to emphasize with this is that there's no kind of um, divine inspiration or like other reason for the different words in a language. They're just people have created different words to mean different things in different programming languages. Um, and I like to think of these words as sort of like a spell. And so um, in order for something to work, you have to say kind of the right order of words in the right order. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making this more confusing or less confusing right now, but um, anyways. Here's a, a set of words that we've, we've put together in programming, the set of words are called functions. Um, the programming language has sort of a specific order and usage of all these functions, just like um, uh, the English language or any other, other language would have. Um, and again, if I do something sort of 
wrong, like I type um, something else, and I try to run this code, the computer is telling me, I don't understand what that is you just typed. So it's a good idea um, to look down at this, um, this console to see if the to see if there's an error at any point. So back to our um, sketch here. I'm gonna add a few more repetitions. Um, some other functions you can use are pixelate, for example. Um, Uh, there's also a color function. Um, so, and I will go more into later exactly what the color function does. Some, something I like to do sometimes is to put each um, function on its own line just to see to see each function separately. Um, there's no right way to, to do this. You could write the code or format the code how you want to. Um, as long as there's no extra space between lines like this. Because then if I try to run this... Oh, actually, I guess that works. Okay. Um, and so you can just go ahead and try changing numbers, try changing the order of these um, to see what happens. Um, oh, that's kind of nice. Um, we can change, change the colors. Let's see. We could add another repeat. Um, we could add another rotate um, we could maybe pixelate this even more and already just with this short amount of functions we're sort of getting a lot of different patterns and so go ahead and sort of experiment with these um, I want to make a distinction here. We have this first word that's an oscillator, and then we have these other things that modify the oscillator. So rotate, repeat, kaleidoscope, pixelate. All of those things don't work on their own. They have to be modifying something else. And so um, we need something like an oscillator, which is a source um, as the basis for the visuals. In addition to oscillator, there's there's um, other sources that we can use. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this code just to start from scratch. So another um, source we can use is a shape. Uh, the shape has different parameters. Triangle, it's the number of sides of shape. So you could keep increasing it and maybe if I put uh, 700 or something the shape has so many sides that it starts to look like a circle. Um, another function I could use is scale to make things uh, bigger or smaller. Um, I could use color again. I could use repeat again. Let's see. I guess I'm going to repeat it a lot. Um, another source we could use is a solid. That's just a solid color. Uh, 
And so you might be wondering, well, how do I know which, which sources there are, which outputs there are, and where can I find more information about that? Um, if you go to this question mark um, and scroll down a little bit, there's a few different resources um, related to Hydra. Um, and so if you click here, uh, documentation on GitHub, we see this is actually all the source code for Hydra. So Hydra is open source, with, which basically means that anyone, all the code that makes it work, anyone can see it and make their own copy and modify it and also share that code. Um, and inside the GitHub, there's also a sort of tutorial introduction. So if, if you'd like, you could also get started in that way. Um, um, and there's also uh, some different uh, resources. But going back to here, I'm going to click here on the complete list of functions. And um, just there's the functions are, are organized into different categories. And for now, we're just going to look at uh, sources and geometry and color. So I'll go ahead and click on sources. Um, and so these are some of the different sources that I could use. Um, so here I could also type noise and I'm going to get rid of these here and we'll see what that does. Noise makes this texture and there's a parameter here that changes how noisy it is and a second parameter that changes how much it's moving. Um, uh, there's also Voronoi that generates this sort of pattern. Um, and again, not both of these we could um, change, start to transform them using different functions. Um, and so this, in programming languages, often there's a, um, a sort of spell book with all the words that you're allowed to use in that programming language. And so um, in, in Hydra, you can access it again by clicking the question mark and going to the complete list of functions.